one another, Lord, in your presence. I pray that you be with each and every one of us here today, Lord. May we gain knowledge and understanding from your word. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Well, again, welcome. Sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. First time visit. Oh, yeah, you know what? I didn't do that. Hey, is there any first timers here today? Visitors? Anyone? Anyone? None? Okay. Well, welcome anyway. Thank you. And the kids, if you would, you may be dismissed. Follow Shannon there. Shannon, don't forget that air conditioner. Thank you. Sorry, I'm dying up here. Anyway, um, again, thank you for coming out. Um, we're going to, I know, I hear you complaining over there. She, she doesn't like it whenever the fans are on or it's any air conditions. Everybody have their Bibles? Yes. Okay, I have no specific passage for you today. We're going to be all over the place. I'm going to be talking about fear. So I have them up on the board for you. Um, I'll have you turn to a few specific ones that are a bit longer. But we're going to, they're going to come fast and heavy, so I, I didn't want to take the time to, uh, to let you guys turn to them. So, um, you know, historians will probably call our era the age of anxiety. Anxiety is a natural result when our hopes are centered in anything short of God and His will for us. Billy Graham first wrote those words in 1965. You know, he thought it was bad then. Wow. You know, how things have changed in the last 55 years. And boy, is that statement true today. At its best, anxiety distracts us from our relationship with God and the truth that He is Lord in heaven, as Matthew 11.25 tells us. At its worst, anxiety is a crippling disease, taking over our minds and plunging our thoughts into darkness. But God wants so much more from us, or for us, than to walk through life full of fear, worry, and anxiety. Are you afraid today? Do you fear what the future may bring? If so, then understanding what the Bible says about fear may help you overcome your fear. See, everyone has fear. From the time when we were a child through the time when we will grow old and die, everyone has fears. They may change as the seasons of life change, but we still have them. Whether you like it or not, we have all experienced or will experience a time when we are crippled by fear. Fear is a common human emotion that is deeply wired into our subconscious and conscious mind. It is natural for us to fear. But that does not mean that fear should rule us, should control us, or focus our lives. Uncontrolled fear can lead to irrational thinking and behaviors, or worse, spiritual paralysis or spiritual death. Let's take a look at one of the strongest emotions that we will experience in our life. Let's examine what the Bible has to say and see what it can do for us in helping us overcome our fear. I have for you several biblical keys in regards to our fear. The first key, realize that God is with you. People fear a lot of things. We fear what the future holds for us, corrupt officials, right? That's pretty, pretty common fear today with the election looming. Illnesses, again, with what's going on in our world with the current coronavirus. And by the way, this isn't the first one that we've had. This is like the fifth that the world has seen. So it's not really anything special. This is the fifth one since 1965 that has been documented. <clears throat> Anyway, obviously, illness is a big thing today. Terrorist attack. Remember, that was huge in the 80s and 90s, right? We've lived through that. Financial crisis, 2008. Whose 401k got crushed? 
in 2008. I know mine did. <laughs> you know? Death. The list goes on. And each person has their own specific group of fears that paralyze us. See, the problem with fear, when not controlled, is that it may, lay, it may, lack, or may lead to a lack of spiritual growth. Instead of moving forward with faith or in faith, we tend to stay in our comfort zone. Never going out to those things that may frighten us or may cause us anxiety. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now, God was speaking to Israel in that passage, but it applies to us as well as His children also. This verse gives us the reason to never be fearful. We must not fear because God is with us. You can't ever escape it. He's always there. Other passages confirm why we should not be afraid. Psalm 118, 6. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Having God on your side is more than enough for you to never be afraid of what the future may hold for you. If God protects you from all forms of harm, what should you fear? If God is on your side, what can man do to you? This sentiment is expressed in one of the most read Psalm, Psalm 23. We all are familiar with that. The Lord is my shepherd, right? Verse 4 says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I want you to picture that. Imagine for a moment that God is with you, right beside you. The same God who is supreme ruler of the entire universe. The same God who made that universe, the heaven and the earth. The place that you now stand. The same God who holds all the power to protect you. He's right beside you. Will you then still be afraid? The logical answer, of course, is no. Of course, it's easier said than done, right? Let's look at the next biblical key. The second key, trust in God. I saw a bumper sticker once, maybe you've seen it too. It read, every opportunity to fear is also an opportunity to trust God. Just to make sure that sticks in your mind, I'm going to repeat it for you. Every opportunity to fear is an opportunity to trust God. I strongly believe this is something we should remember, that we need to remember. Every time we are afraid, we must see it as an opportunity to surrender everything into God's hands. We simply trust Him that all things will work out for good as long as we are doing our part, as Romans 8.28 says. Another familiar verse. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. Did you see the conditions in that though? You have to love God and you have to be called to His purposes. Psalm 56, 3 and 4. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? In most cases, when we are afraid, we are powerless. We really can't do anything um, with most of the fears in our life. You can't control whether the terrorists are going to bomb the shopping mall that you're in. You can't prevent natural disasters from destroying your city or your house. 
I mean, we see that uh, what Tropical Storm Sally, they're anticipating it hit um, Louisiana again. And it's gonna be a hurricane, they suspect, before it makes landfall. Those people in Louisiana, they, they can't stop that. They can't control it. It's out of their control. You can't prevent death from knocking on your door. What are you gonna do? It's like that commercial, right? Did you see the commercial about the, the appliance where the Grim Reaper knocks on this lady's door and she's like, no, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. There's no stopping it. Hebrews 9.27 It is appointed for man to die. The date of your death is already known to God. You have an appointment that's already been scheduled. You're just waiting for it to get there. You can't make a phone call like you can to your doctor and change it. It is what it is. Why should we fear? Matthew 6, 27, Jesus himself says, And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? <laughs> what does it bother? What does it worry? You know? It's out of your control. Instead, just surrender your fear to God and trust Him that He will do what is best for you. After all, God is our Heavenly Father. Like a father who protects his children, so also God will protect us from evil. Which brings us to the third key. Seek the peace of God. Fear brings turmoil to our hearts and minds. When we are filled with so much fear that we can't think properly, it seems that everything we do is subject to danger. We are constantly stricken with the thought of what can go wrong. Thankfully, Jesus left us His peace. Not our peace, but His. John 14, 27, Christ Himself says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus gives us a reason why we must not be afraid. He gives us peace, and this should calm our fear. But how can we extinguish fear in our hearts? The simple answer is that the two are contrary to one another. You cannot have peace and fear at the same time. You are either peaceful or you are fearful. It can't be both. You can't be at peace and fear. The peace that Jesus brings originates from Him. It's not something that you can get from the world. For most people, peace is the absence of conflict or war. But for God, peace is having an intimate and close, and close relationship with Him. Peace is having God in your life. Peace comes from the assurance that God is always in control. When you are filled with this type of peace, then you can cast away fear from your heart. The fourth key, be filled with love. God is love. And those who follow God must also be filled with love. If we want to get rid of fear, we must replace it with something. If you re remove fear from your life, you're left with a hole that must be filled. And that must be replaced by something. If we keep our minds empty, it's easy for fear to return. 1 John 4.18 tells us that there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Now here's one of the most important keys to getting rid of fear, and that is to be we must be filled with love. We can cast out fear with love, but how? Love, as described in the Bible, not by the world. 
cannot produce fear. In fact, if we truly love God, we should not fear anything. We don't need to fear death because after death, we are secure with God. We can be confident that we will meet our Creator during our next waking moment. What's the scripture? Absent from the body, we are present with the Lord. But while we are absent from the Lord, we are stuck in this body. I, I don't know about you, but I look forward to that day. My father and I had to cut a tree down at uh, my aunt's house a couple of days ago. Huge maple leaning over the house. You know, and, and it was on the edge of a bank and all the limbs were growing out towards the sun, which so towards the house, it was over top of the house. So, you know, they're fearing that it's going to fall on their house. For good reason. It's a big tree. About, you know, that big in diameter at the base. And so we're sitting there looking at this going, I don't want to do this. You know, I was in fear that this tree would drop on their house when we started cutting it down. You know, so we wrenched to come along and, you know, pulling on it to try to put some tension on it to pull it away from the house. I'm feeling that today. My shoulders, my back is killing, you know, from jerking on that kind of, yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I can't wait to be absent from this pathetic, pain-filled body that I have to wear today. But when we die as believers... We're promised a new tent, a new dwelling. We should be looking forward to that time, not running after it. Obviously, don't, don't mistake me. We shouldn't be seeking our death, but it, 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 holds, no, it holds no fear for us. We, what is it that Paul says? To live is Christ, to die is gain. As long as we have the love of God in our hearts and lives, we can expect fear to never bother us. The moment that our love wavers, however, that's the same moment that fear starts to creep in. When love prevails, fear is stopped. When love overcomes, fear is suppressed. When love reigns, Fear is banished. The fifth key, fear God instead. There is a type of fear in the Bible that's completely opposite to the spirit of fear that we live with every day. And that is the fear of the Lord. It is a type of fear that is encouraged in the Bible. But it's not like, like we in our English would expect it. The fear that we should have towards the Lord, Lord is, is an awe, an overwhelmingness, for lack of a better word. I don't even know if that is a word. I just made it up. But that's the fear of the Lord that we're looking at, not a trembling in our boots fear. Although, if you don't have that relationship with God, you'll experience that fear someday. But it's an awe that we should have. It is the type of fear that is encouraged in the Bible. And every Christian, every believer, every follower of God should have this fear. If we are to get rid of fear, we must replace it with the right type of fear. And that is the fear of the Lord. In the Bible, there's a lot of passages that command us to fear God. We're going to look at a few. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Proverbs 1. It should be a pretty easy one to find the middle of the Bible practically. Right past the longest book of Psalm, or of the Psalms, I should say. Proverbs 1. We're going to look at verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Another one, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. 
Proverbs 14.27 The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. If we are to fear, we must fear God instead. But why does fearing God, what does it really mean? Fearing God means that we must respect and revere Him. Fearing God does not cripple or paralyze us, but rather it keeps us from sinning. When we fear God, we submit to His will, and therefore we rather follow His commandments. Instead of fearing what the future holds for us, we must fear God who is able to deliver us from all types of danger. By fearing God, we can delight more in His commandments, as Psalm 112.3 tells us, or 112.1. We will be wiser, as Proverbs 9.10 states, and ultimately be saved from eternal death, as Matthew 10.28 says. The sixth key, be strong and courageous. When Moses died, Israel lost a great leader. But it was time for Joshua to step forward to take the baton from him. However, the Israelites were afraid. They didn't know whether Joshua would have the same authority, the same leadership that Moses had. During this time, Joshua needed encouragement. The people were afraid, and they also needed an assurance from God. In Joshua 1, you will see the command, be strong and courageous, had been repeated three times. Let's look at one. Turn, if you would, to Joshua 1. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. It's worth noting that God actually commanded Joshua to be strong and courageous. It isn't a request of God. It's a command. Be strong and courageous. Instead of fearing, God encourages these people to be strong and courageous. But what does it mean to be strong and courageous? It means that we should not stay weak. They must be strong in the Lord. They must obtain their strength from the supreme, eternal God. <coughs> Being strong isn't enough, but they must also be courageous. Being courageous means that they should have the confidence to do what God wants them to do. Though things may not seem to go their way, being courageous means that you are able to move forward and trust God. Trust that God is in control of the situations around you. See, people can be brave without wisdom. You know, we might call that bravery. Some might call it stupidity. You know, you, you can be brave doing things that are foolish. You can be reckless, not fearing anything. But that's not the type of courageous that you are called to be. God wants Joshua and the Israelites to have a different kind of courage. To have the courage to do what is right and proper in God's eyes. Being strong and courageous, you can definitely overcome fear. The seventh key, remember God is in control. If you are a child of God, nothing can happen to you that is not allowed by God. Turn again in your Bibles to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. I'll give you time to get there. Because we're going to finish way early. 
<laughs> you know, the last time I did this, I'm like cutting things out to try to, I don't know, I don't know what happened. Not enough time. Psalm 91. We'll pick it up in the first verse. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. Hmm, sounds familiar today, doesn't it? He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. Turn again in your Bible to Job, the book of Job. Most of you, I am sure, are familiar with this story. I want to touch it from a certain perspective. Job chapter 1, starting in verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Con I'll step aside from that. Contrary to what most churches believe, Satan still has access to God. He still has access to heaven. What's going on here in Job still happens today. How else can Satan be called the accuser of the brethren if he can't whisper into God's ear about what I do wrong? Satan still has access to God, still has access to the throne, that will change, and I encourage you to come to our study on Sunday mornings where we will be talking about that very thing. There is a time that is yet future where Satan will be cast down from heaven permanently without access. Thankfully, if you are a child of God, you will not see those days on this earth what we call the Great Tribulation, or the latter half of Daniel's 70th week, to be more precise. So, just be aware that Satan is given the title of the accuser of the brethren because he can still accuse your wrongdoings to God. But thankfully, when God hears that, he looks at his son. Not at our sin. Continuing on in verse 7. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and from on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and an upright man, who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him... Do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. You know, that may seem a little harsh, right? Yes. God allowing Satan to do what he wills with Job's possessions. And later on in chapter 2, Satan comes back and says, you know, Job still didn't turn, didn't sin against God. And, and Job says, well, you're protecting him. And God says, okay. You, you can have his body, just don't kill him. That seems really harsh to us, right? But I want you to look at it from a different angle. 
We don't have the time to get into the minutia of God's sovereignty. I encourage you, if you are interested, to dig into Romans chapter 9. When it talks about the sovereignty of God, and it mentions that God is like a potter and we are like His clay. And who are you as the formed pot to question what God does and doesn't do to His creation? I know that's a humbling experience or a humbling thought, but it needs to be. Right? God holds all the cards. He is the creator. But in this passage, look at it from a different angle. God set the line for Satan. He said, you can do this, no more. You can do this, no more. Satan can't pass God's lines. God sets the meter. He's the one that says, you can go this far and no further. He is, uh, Satan is still restricted by God's hand. Now there's a time when that chain, that hold on Satan will be loosened. But again, that's in the latter half of the Daniel 70th week. And thank God, if you're a believer, you're not going to be there to see it. Amen. Yeah. Amen is right. Amen is right. I don't know if you've ever read through the book of Revelation. But uh, yeah, you, you don't want to be on this planet at that time at all. You don't want anybody that you know to be on that planet at this time. The first plague, a third of the earth is destroyed. The second group, another, or the first group is a quarter. And if you estimate the earth is 8 billion people, that's 2 billion people dead in the first series. A third of the earth then is destroyed. That is another 2 billion people because there will be 6 billion people left. Half of the population within the first two sets. That doesn't even include... You, you, you don't want to be here. You don't want anybody that you know, even your worst enemy, to be here. Come out and listen to the study. Study it with us as we go through Revelation at 9.30. We'll be starting back up next week. I encourage each and every one of you. It's something you need to hear. You need to know how serious this is. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to get off my soapbox now. Studying Romans 9 to look at the sovereignty of God would take a long time if we did it from this pulpit. I encourage you to dig into it. You'll see it in the Exodus, how, you know, Pharaoh was... It, there's so much there. And I encourage you to, to look it up. God sets the limits. Not Satan. God is all-powerful. Only God is everywhere. Satan has locality. Thankfully, he can't take a personal interest in each and every one of us at the same time. He's not everywhere like God. Only God can do that. God can and does restrict Satan. Satan and his minions can only do as much as God allows them. We will face things that make us fearful, but we follow the one who has already overcome the world. John 16, 33 says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Which brings us to the last key. Pray to God. One of the best ways to overcome fear is to simply surrender all of your fear in, unto God. We can only do so much in ourselves. There comes a point in our life when we are powerless to escape what, what causes us fear. Those situations are beyond our control. The only thing that we can do, the only thing that we must do, is present our fears into the hands of our Heavenly Father. 
Psalm 34, 4 tells us, I sought the Lord, and He answered me and delivered me from all my fears. When King David's spirit was in tumult, when his fears were too difficult for him to handle, when his mind was tormented by worry, he sought the Lord. When we seek God with all our hearts, He will hear us and deliver us from all our fears. When you are fearful, bend your knees, clasp your hands, pray, pray to God. God is more than willing to deliver you and to eliminate the disturbance produced by fear. He might not remove the circumstances, but He can give you the power to cope with those. He can give you peace instead of fear. So in closing, I'd like you to turn to Philippians 4. Philippians 4, New Testament. Philippians 4, starting in verse 6. Common passage. Uh, many of us are familiar with this. Philippians 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. See, our instruction, however, doesn't stop there. The chapter goes on to tell believers exactly what we should focus on. And it's not fear, terrorism, illness, disease, death, or evil. Look at verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. The first step to an anxiety-free mind, a mind free of fear, is to give your life to Jesus Christ. These key points that I talked about will do you no good if you are not a believer in Christ. That's the first step. Make your salvation sure. Seek out one of us for guidance. Myself, Chuck, Rhonda Beth, Gino. There's so many of them. Seek us out. We can walk you through this. We, you, can, you can ensure that, you're, that you have Christ's salvation in you. We'd be more than happy to walk you through that. Once you've taken that step, it's important to fix your thoughts on Jesus and the promise that He is preparing a place for His followers in heaven, as John 14, 2 and 3 says. Look, folks, read the end. We win. There's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing to fear. Let's close. Heavenly Father, I thank You, Lord, for Your Word. I thank you for the wisdom that is packed in every page of this book, your Bible. I pray that you would drive it deep into our hearts and our minds, Lord, that it be your word that we think on when fear strikes, that uh, you would remind us to crack open your scriptures and read the truth that's therein. Lord, I pray for these people here. I pray that you would give them comfort, that you would give them peace that you would put your hedge of protection about their minds, Lord, that they may be steadfast on you. And I pray that you would give us traveling mercies as we go, that we may come again to fellowship with one another, Lord, and to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. I wish you a great day. Well, I didn't prepare a song. I never do. By the time I'm done with this, I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you again for coming out, and I pray that you go in peace.